Can you believe it is the last week of January 2024? I don't know about you, but my year is off to an incredible start. And that is thanks in no small part to our audience that joins us every single week here on the Tech Ed Podcast. We appreciate everyone who shares the Tech Ed Podcast with their networks, tells them about the great things that we're doing. But another great way that you can impact our reach and our ability to secure the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent is by leaving us a review right there on Apple or Spotify. If you are an iPhone user and you're listening on Apple Podcasts, all you have to do is scroll down to the bottom of our show page where you will see ratings and reviews. Leave us a five-star review if you love the show. And even better than that, write a review with some comments about all the value that the Tech Ed Podcast brings to you. If you're on Spotify, they don't have that feature to leave a comment, but you can still give us those five stars on that platform. And that will help Apple and Spotify suggest it to even more people who can benefit from the content that we share with you here every week on the Tech Ed Podcast. Now let's get on to this week's episode. Thanks for joining us on the Tech Ed Podcast. I am your host, Matt Kirkner, and our audience members know that we talk all the time about disruption in the world of education. We love the fact that there are people out there that are trying to figure out new ways to educate the next generation of learners to realize that we are in a world that is always changing and in as much the world of education also needs to be always changing. Now, a number of you will remember that we had a guest last quarter. His name was Doug Burgum. He is the governor of the state of North Dakota. And when the governor was on with us at that time, he was actually running for president of the United States of America. He has, by the way, since announced his departure from that race, but certainly had a wonderful time watching Doug Burgum in his journey through the presidential race. Of course, anybody knows that if you are going to be president of the United States of America, your journey has to flow through the state of Iowa. The Iowa caucuses are one of the things that absolutely determines momentum in the presidential race. And because of that, Governor Doug Burgum at the time was spending tremendous time in the state of Iowa, getting to know the people of that state. I know it well. I used to own a company that had a manufacturing plant there. Wonderful people in the state of Iowa and really in so many ways, a microcosm of the United States of America. Now, one of the things that you'll know about Governor Burgum, if you listen to that podcast, is that he is absolutely an education disruptor and he is happy to support, to fund, to share the stories of people that are disrupting education. And so it was the governor of North Dakota, actually, that connected us with today's guest, a relatively small school district in the state of Iowa, Western Iowa to be exact, doing huge, huge, huge things. And so we are going to learn all about education disruption at the K-12 level today. My guest is Justin Wagner. Justin is the superintendent of the Woodbine School District. Justin, such an honor to have you with us. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much, Matt, for having me. I appreciate it. Now, anytime I'm with a military veteran, I always go out of my way, not just to thank you for your service, but to thank you for my freedom and the freedom of all the people in the United States of America. And that's where we are going to start. You had an interesting route to the position of superintendent. I don't know in this day and age how many folks leading school districts actually served in the U.S. military, but you did. I would love to learn, first of all, before we get into it, tell us a little bit about your military background. Yeah, thanks for asking. I appreciate your support. Uh, thank you for the support. I think it's really important. Less than 1% of the U.S. population continues to serve. So thank you for that. So 29 years um, in, in the uh, Air National Guard, uh, multiple deployments. I started as an enlisted member in civil engineering and then uh, was fortunate to move on and up and and certainly um, have learned so much from the United States military and and, and so many leadership lessons uh, from overseas as well. And uh, right now I sit as a deputy wing commander of the 185th Air Refueling Wing in Sioux City, Iowa. So let me ask you this question. You ever uh, crossed paths with a former Tech Ed podcast guest by the name of Paul Knapp, who is the adjutant general of the Wisconsin National Guard? Is that name ring a bell at all? Uh, I, I have not. I have not. But when you start talking about the tags or the adjutant generals of states, those are highly revered, highly respected people and individuals. So uh, we, we uh, outside of the Iowa Wisconsin rivalry, I would I think I would respect him very much um, being being the tag of Wisconsin. Absolutely. We'll have Melissa uh, put that in the show notes, that particular episode, and you and everyone else can go back and listen to that. But but certainly, uh, certainly was a great guest and, and, and talk about a, a true civil servant and somebody who's done great things, as you have. So you think 
about titles and everybody loves big titles, but you know what? I love the, you know, the mid-level leaders, the the supervisors, that you know, that mid-level executive of any organization and and certainly 29 years in the Air National Guard certainly uh, you deserve tremendous respect for that. Tell us about how that that background not only kind of informs and, and influences your work as superintendent, but I'd also love to know about the path. How does somebody go from 29 years in the military to being a school superintendent? So uh, two two things there that pop into my mind immediately that I feel like I've, I've benefited from learning from the military side. There's two pieces. The first one is go. Just go. Do not sit in white. Don't sit and talk about it to a point of, of exhaustion. There certainly has to be a level of planning, a level of thought. And then you have to act. And in education, sometimes we talk a lot, and that's great. And we need to. We need to be planners. We need to be thoughtful. And then some. You got to have an action orientation. You got to go. So the first one I'd say is, you know, we, we, it's time. It's go. It's go time. And then you know, the second one is 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 a story from a friend of mine on the military side, and it's a long story. So I'll, I'll make it shorter here. He had lost a close friend to him uh, in combat. And, uh, and I was in his office and we were talking one day and um, I said, what's the what's the one thing that you would take away or something you would pass along to me or you want me to know? And he said, make your life matter. Just make it matter. Whatever you do, put it, put the pedal to the floor and give it everything you got. And so at the end, you can look back and say, you know, I, I wish you know you, you don't second guess yourself. And so I would say those are the two things that just pop out immediately on those questions from the military side into education. I, I'm a. I'm probably fairly unique from the perspective of doing, you know, having a military career and still having a military career and then having, you know, a public uh, education career. Both are servant, um, servant leadership uh, moments. I take great pride in that. I'm here to serve. I'm here to support in both of those roles. And so I think that's a real common theme between, you know, the military and education. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, you know, starting in a small town and um, and and really not growing up with much. I think th- those have been huge gifts in my life, you know. And so I, you know, I think about that all the time, and uh, and I think that's driven me, and that's and that ho- helps to kind of shape, you know, kind of the the person I am. And then you really try to get those those people around you that are absolutely rock stars. And like you mentioned, you know, you just got to try to find those mid level folks that really make it happen, and they bring it to life. They bring that that vision to life. And so I've been really blessed in that way. And you see that both on the military and education sides, you know, there's just some amazing people that are are sacrificing a lot on both sides, you know, to bring to bring visions to life. No question. I love the clarity with which you answer that question. And certainly the whole idea of, of goal and action and the importance of let's not just stand around and talk about this, which you're right. That happens a lot, not just in education, but I think in a lot of public sectors. And and so let's let's get on with it. Let's take action. Let's make things happen. That's that's obviously incredibly important. The whole idea of whatever you do make a difference and making sure that you're making a difference for yourself, your family, your country, the people that um, are your stakeholders, whether you're a school superintendent, a company CEO, or whatever that role is, incredibly important important. And then this whole idea of service and in in whatever we're doing, that we're serving others, that we're helping make the world a better place and that we're helping change lives. And, and boy, if there isn't a career and a background that doesn't just bleed that whole idea of service that you shared in your in your first answer, I don't know what would be. So so perfect and, and great conversation so far. I want to start getting into a little bit more of the whole world of education. Um, you know, we talked about in the in the intro the importance of disrupting education. You've talked about somebody who's a, a person of action who wants to make change, make positive change. But let's look at the current state first of education and why do you think in, in some ways that it needs to be disrupted? And, and I would I would be curious particularly about, you know, what we're measuring, what are those KPIs, if you will, that we're looking at both for students and individuals and district-wide? And then, uh, and then your thoughts, Justin, on, on why you think we need to shake that up a little bit. You know, at, at the end of the day, when you put good people and in, in really... Um, inadequate systems, the system wins. It just does. We've got a lot of great educators out there. And then we get, we putting them, me, thumb point me, guys like me putting them in, into systems that chew them up, spit them out, just sucks the joy and life out of a passion that they have. So that's a personal goal of mine is to make a system that works for our kids and works for our adults. You know, you can't, you know, you got to have some level of, of frameworks, but paper before people just doesn't work. So, you know, from that perspective, the system has to change. I always say we've done the wrong thing right for so long, we don't know the difference. And that, that's their biggest challenge, right? So you're looking at that 30, 40, 40 year time hack of people that have been raised in a system in public education, and then they went to a college or university to become a teacher and put in a lot of time and effort, and then they went back and taught in it. And now we 
we need to work in simultaneity in terms of changing the system. That's a very unique challenge, as you've probably seen in your career, being very successful and really just managing change. And so if you get once we get into that public education sector, there's there's just some really unique challenges in terms of working in simultaneity on the on the change side. I don't think we need to go any far. I'm not going to spend a lot of t- time on the data. So ours has been a four-year process, really. Uh, and, and we spent um, a, a lot of time with our staff talking about how students are frustrated, parents are frustrated, teachers are frustrated, administrators are frustrated, and the communities are frustrated. And so, you know, once you get all the fingers on the fist, it's time to change, right? It's time to go. And so we spent a lot of time on that, lots of Gallup polls, lots of other data that we've shared. I think that's very important to have data and facts. You know, there's a point for feelings and then there's a point for facts and you got to use both. And I think in order to really generate that change, one of the things, uh, Matt, that was really important for us is having a rallying cry for that change, a purpose for the change. Uh, in, in the state of Iowa in 1950, there were over 4,500 school districts. We started this year with 327. Most of those are real communities that will never come back. And so that's been a rallying cry for us. And and it's really a rallying cry for a lot of rural, small communities. And so what that did is kind of brought people together uh, and then really kind of started to launch our our journey uh, of change. So maybe if we talk a little bit less on the data side and a little bit more on the perhaps the qualitative side, you suggested that students were frustrated, administrators were frustrated, teachers are frustrated. Is there an example or two without hurting any feelings too strongly or, or, you know, coloring outside the lines that you might be able to offer of the kinds of things that you think people are frustrated with in the world of of, uh, education on a traditional standpoint? Yeah, lack of personalization specifically. Mm-hmm. I think you can see the national polls, but then I always try to, you know, kind of the smell test locally. Is that what we feel locally too? And we're a blue collar community of great Americans that work really hard who were frustrated with school, quite frankly. And so mm-hmm. um, sitting in desk and rows works for some, it doesn't work for all. And so that's what we're looking for. That personalization, I think, is what people would be frustrated with. The more we learn about the, the the human capacity and specifically even about brain capacity and how we process learning, the more we know there's more talents than what we thought. And I, I always say each kid has their own learning language. And sometimes we speak in a language that doesn't make sense to them. It doesn't mean they're not smart. You know, one of the things I'm I'm really proud of is, is you know, we've been able to reduce our special education um, identification levels. And I think a lot of it has to do with kids that are smart. They're just not smart in a language that we're talking about. And if you keep judging a, a fish by how they cr- climb a tree, you know, that old adage, you know, you know, they're just always going to get an F, but you throw that fish in water and boy, can they swim. And that's what we've done here K-12 is change the system because we want fish to be judged by how they do in water and uh, not how they climb trees. You know, I, and I, I'm guessing most of our audience that listens regularly is smiling because they know this is right up my alley. And I talk all the time about, um, you know, I never thought of myself as a dumb kid and I did fine in school. I mean, I didn't fail in school and there, were, there I'm not going to say there was never an F on my report card, but there weren't many, but I wasn't a straight A student either. You know, I was never a classroom learner. I was never the person that could sit in there and sit in a lecture and watch somebody draw on at that time, a chalkboard, later a whiteboard, later a smart board, what have you, you know, that just was not my style of learning. So I literally would have to drudge my way through a, you know, six, seven hour classroom day and then go home and learn it on my own. If I wanted to learn it, that was how I got through school. Frankly, that was how I got through college too. Too. And that's fine. I mean, I, I have a daughter who is like the model classroom learner. You know, she hears it once, boom, it sticks. Some people are like that. That was never me. So when I hear somebody like you talking about the different modes of learning, reaching learners in different ways, understanding that there are people that will gain competency through and some of them through listening to a lecture, some of them through watching a video, some of them through hands on learning, most of us through a combination of all of those. And, and that's just really it's really music to my ears. You know, you talk about some of the um, you know, some of the aspects of education where we get into doing it the same way every day for so long that we forgot how to do it right. I used to talk about that all the time in my manufacturing days where you walk in and you run the same products on the same line with the same people for the same customers over and over and over again to where it's almost impossible for you to see just those obvious changes that are sitting right in front of you because you've become so accustomed to what you see day in and day out that you don't recognize all those continuous improvement opportunities. In fact, we talk in Kaizen, the world of Kaizen or continuous improvement in manufacturing bringing people from outside of the manufacturing world to the floor to watch what's going on. Because a lot of times those folks will ask the kind of questions just out of their own naivete or their own clear or new thinking that'll bring us to a new space. Clearly, that is what you're doing. 
uh, in your school district, Justin, is, is thinking about things a new way. So as we move from maybe the traditional way of educating, we're going to get into this in more depth, but give us a sense for what kind of things we should be measuring in education um, as opposed to maybe classroom performance or standardized testing, which you know, both have their place. But but tell us what, what kind of things should we be measuring as we look at the success of an individual student? So I think, like you said, there, there's a absolutely a place for that foundation of learning. You know, K four we know is literacy and numeracy, and then a, a good friend of mine always said, reminded me. You know, he said, "I don't carry the one in the cockpit." You know, after about fourth fifth grade, you know, there's a level of math there that you're going to need to get it just in time, just in case. And and so, you know, I, I really think how we should judge or how we should kind of start looking at some of those metrics because we do need to have those. It can't just be you know, kind of whatever we think and willy nilly. Um, I, I think it has to have two capacity. It has to have two components to it. It has to have a personalization component. Well, there's some really strong research out there now that talks about what personalization means. We know that in a recent, that recent Gallup poll that 92% of, of parents said, yep, yeah, we want personalization for our students. It's really hard to argue with personalization, right? Like I think most parents, most community members, most adults want personalization, for, not only for themselves, but for their kids. And, and and but the implementation flaws are happening. Like, what does that look like? Do we have? I think we have the skill now. We just don't have the will to really pull that thing across the line. And so that's what we we worked a lot on. And then the second piece on the personalization side is it's got to be there has to be a level of voice and choice for students. And I think then we can hold them accountable to their voice and choice, right? So in terms of, and that's something that we've we've been able to kind of learn from others and then kind of put the whole chocolate and peanut butter together here for that new model. And that's where kids get to choose. So if you want your math class, okay, go ahead and you get to choose if that's through agriculture, if that's through manufacturing, if that's through IT, if that's through police science. And what we're finding is that where, where kids are they have choice and they can see relevance to it, the retainability, the stick and stay is happening, right? It just, it seems so logical, but it's so hard to kind of get going. So I think the big picture of the question there, I, I would say you, you have to have the personalization level and then you have to have the relevance level. And and I think the final step on how you tangibilize that or bring that all together, it, it has to be local control. So you have to, at some level, you got to look at that and say, what we need in Western Iowa isn't maybe what they need in New York City. It may not be what they need in Idaho, Ohio, or California. But our region here has a certain level of manufacturing presence. Our region here has a certain level of businesses that I know, is, in, in, according to the Iowa Workforce Development page, um, you know, th there's over 60,000 jobs available. We need to be able to move faster to that, that, to that, that, that need. And so that, I think that's a really important part of how we judge, you know, rather than a one-time test, you got to have the base knowledge, but how we judge the effectiveness of schools. You, know, you talk about the importance of voice and choice, and it feels like it's successful for two reasons. Number one is I'm enabling a student to choose their own pathway and choose something that they're interested in, that they genuinely have an interest in. They're going to be that much more um, dedicated to their studies, that much more enthusiastic about what they're doing. And I think the other part of it is it puts skin in the game. You know, if I'm walking into a classroom and I'm and I'm or into my school and I've got seven courses that I need to go through and those are prescribed for me and this is what I have to do, that's one level of commitment. When it's like, no, we're going to empower you to make the decision that you want, to learn the way that you want, to learn the content that you want, as long as you're meeting a certain level of standards, that totally opens up that student and I think creates a level of commitment we won't, won't otherwise see. Just awesome. I can't wait to get into this whole concept of Ignite and the, the programming that you've put together around the concepts of personal personalization and voice and choice that we're talking about already. Before we do that, let's make sure our, our audience is familiar, Justin, with your district itself. So tell us a little bit about Woodbine. Uh, what, would, what would they be interested to know? Yeah, so we so Western Iowa, kind of central with central Western Iowa, we have 507 students, Matt, and I could I wow. could uh, in the whole district uh, in the whole district pre K twelve, which we absolutely love it. We love that we know our kids so well, and um, and so it's uh, we have two campuses. So the Woodbine Community School District is one, and then there was a separate you know Ignite Pathways Regional Center was set up for seven through twelve. And, and so um, from the perspective of the conversation on disruption, so we've created a new system, K-12, and then simultaneously built Ignite Pathways Regional Center from the ground up. There was, you know, uh, nothing really existed, you know, from that perspective four years ago. And, and they made a dangerous decision um, when I came and said, hey, you got a blank slate. Because I was like, well, I'm in my give back years now. I've got all these lessons I've learned and so many things I want to do. And and so that was uh, that was kind of the, the nexus of it. So. 
so tell us about that a little bit. You know, when somebody says we give you a blank slate, I'll be honest with you. I've, you know, I've had opportunities to run a lot of fairly substantial manufacturing. He's been around a lot of different businesses. And, and, you know, I've, I've had that said to me a lot of times. I can tell you that just because someone tells you you have a blank slate doesn't always mean that you have a blank slate. So, so tell me about the community. Were they really open to disruption? Is this something where, where they were just all over finding a new way to do things? Or did you have to fight a few battles along the way? Uh, so the community community has been fantastic. It was just kind of a lightning in a bottle kind of moment. And so my first meeting when I sat down in 2020 was with uh, what I'd call the kind of economic development leadership and then other leaders in the community. And they just said, I think that rallying cry, look, we, you know, we're losing students and um, we've got good people. We love our community. We're proud of our community. And, and we just want to do something different, for, you know, for kids, a different experience for kids. And so certainly, like you said, there's there's definitely um, peaks and valleys uh, along the way. But in terms of the support, the support has been um, has, it's been really, really good. And, and I think, you know, trying to speak really honestly uh, along the way, I think the challenge is is always to try to focus on how to manage change. Because mm-hmm. I think we got to be careful what you wish for. OK, so you want something new and different. Oh, buddy, buckle up. Here we go. Right. And so you're like, right. oh, okay, not that new, not, not that different. Right. Like, let's, you know, can we, right. can we make the roller coaster just a little shorter and a little, the peaks and valleys? And that's not how it works. Right. Like, right. Um, you know, that kind of innovative disruption, as, as you've seen in your career and led, uh, you got to make sure that everybody understands that from the beginning, we have a really clear focus and direction of where we're going. And then, um, you know, the old military adage, nothing survives first contact. You know, you got a great plan. You start hearing zings and pings. You're like, okay, go that way now. Don't keep going that way. (laughs) So you got to be able to pivot. And that's one of the things I think from the military time, I think there's a sense of urgency there that you look, you you can't keep going that direction because your life and limbs on the line. Public education, you know, know, that's not necessarily the same. So when you see those uh, those moments where you're like, I think we should pivot. You got to really take time to convince that sense of urgency. This is the right pivot. Whereas, you know, in, in a different, you know, maybe sector, it's like, hey, yes, that's absolutely the right pivot. So the community has been great. We've passed, you know, um, we've renewed bonds, passed multiple bonds. And so that's always a tangible sign of community support as well. No question. I mean, probably the best one, right? That's the one opportunity almost more either between that and a referendum um, or election, rather. Those are the two opportunities that the public has to speak on the direction of the, you know, most most blatantly. They can say anything they want along the way, but that's where they get their, their true say is, are we going to support the second? Are we going to support the disruptors at the board level when we when we go into the uh, into the ballot box? So obviously, it sounds like you've got the support of, of both of those aspects. Justin, you, may, you, you used a word, you said we're losing students. I'm just curious, losing them intellectually? or in terms of their commitment, lo- literally losing them out of the district, or a lot of times we hear in rural districts, students are, you know, leaving their hometown for whatever comes next and then never coming back and we lose them that way. When you say losing students, give me a sense for what you mean by that. Yeah, so, so I think all of the above, right? So by the time they make the decision to say we're going, our parents says we're going to pull our students and we're going to go somewhere else, it's a death by a thousand cuts, right? It's, it's something where they're saying it's not just this, it's this and this and this and this and this. And Guys like me sometimes are really good at, at you know, kind of um, a, a parent coming with a concern and then not listening and all, and then just, you know, kind of giving the head nod and moving on rather than really saying, well, because it's a lot of work to change the system. I mean, it's much easier to kind of take the onesie twosie shot. And, and like you said, in the uh, short term, yeah. And, and along the way, there certainly are detractors. There's no question on that. I mean, there's certainly people that would say, wow, we're moving really fast. And so, I, you know, they always said it takes a dog year. And we said, I can do a, we can do a better than that. We can do a faster than that seven years. You know, we can do that quicker. Um, and so I, when I, we talk about losing students, I think it's all of the above. You know, and, I, and I, what we found is a silent majority, Matt, that said there, there was a group of kids that they're going to do good kind of no matter what, really, to be honest with you. And and so what we're doing is is kind of, you know, kind of really focusing our time, talents, and treasures on a specific group of students. And then the rest, you know, was kind of just there, right? And so we, we kind of flipped that model and said, we think we can do all. We think we can meet that um, individual student's needs on both the bottom, the middle, and the top, because we think it's really important. And we know the Fortune 500 research out there on CEOs, you know, that C's do get degrees, by the way, right? I mean, right. Yep. you know, there's a lot of C people out there that are that are multi, multi-millionaires. And I, well, and I I'll tell you, say, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just have to have to tell you, I, I spoke to a statewide educators about 400 people in the audience, the Western State, about two months ago. And I had read this, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, but um, in fact, I know it was. And it's that the line was that the secret among 
college and university presidents is that their A students become their professors and their C students become their bigger, biggest donors. So I thought that was absolutely perfect. And it sounds like exactly what you're saying. There's a little truth in every joke, right? So when you talk about losing students, I think that's that's what it means to me. You know, I, I, ne I would have never guessed that this year we had the largest increase in student enrollment in the history of our school district. And, well, and, and in terms of numbers, percentage? Or? Yeah, in, in terms of numbers and percents. And and, wow. and so we're like, wow, you know, that's that's... I never saw that coming. I knew there was interest and I knew people were supportive and they really want. And now, you know, we have, you know, students coming in from all around. And and what we want to do now is try to create that partner and break down some of those parochial walls. Like, because we want to partner with our local communities. I mean, you, you've you probably seen some of that in rural communities. We have so much pride and so many good people keep breaking down those parochial walls in terms of like parochialism, not from a religious standpoint, but from a, a, a very pride standpoint. So when you talk about one of the hurdles you know, that was probably and still exists one of the biggest hurdles and something I need to continue to work on and, and keep drawing people together. For sure. And, you know, as I've got some good friends in the in the western Wisconsin part of the world, and a number of, of uh, school districts that have kind of formed consortiums. And that's one of the biggest challenges they have they talk about. Um, you know, if I grew up in this town of 800 people and there's the town of 700 people that's, you know, 15 miles away and we were we were playing football against each other for our whole our whole academic career and, and growing. And you just, you know, you, you had this kind of this this incredible rivalry and now you're asking us to work together. And, and it's just like, you know, you have to get over that hurdle. I'm sure you run into a little bit of that at times as well in the in the rural part of Iowa that you're in. We, we could keep going on on this, just setting up the topic. I know we've whetted the audience's appetite. We're going to get into Ignite. In just a moment, before we do, as as you arrived at the school district or in the, in the role, um, there was there was a um, plans to open what you're calling the cruise center. Tell us about the cruise center first, and then the next question is going to be about Ignite Pathways. So the cruise center is where we had started. We had one uh, one room in the in the cruise center to start Ignite Pathways, and the cruise center was it stands for Community Recreation, Education, and Wellness. And again, this shows the. Um, a sense of urgency at, at, at a level of a community level that that existed to make this happen, you know, to get that stood up. And so I think there's a level of innovation and entrepreneurial spirit that is alive and well. And and certainly, like I said, there's always a, a there's there's always a group that, you know, you want to spend more time with and help explain it. And then there's a group you you say, hey, we want to do something really cool, and they're like, go. And so that level of trust is so special. And, and uh, you know, things move at the speed of trust, you always say. So I think that piece of on the cruise center built during COVID, uh, during time where everything else shut down, that thing was was uh, moving and booming. And so uh, great facility, about 45,000 square feet, indoor pool. It's 24-7 um, for the wellness side of it so people can work out for a quality of life for, for a small community. And then, like I said, we had a room and then a um, – a kind of a lab to start the Ignite Pathways Regional Center out of the Cruise Center. So let's get into Ignite. So we're, we're talking about it's now, it's time to go. Uh, we're, we're certainly ready to do something really, really big. We're ready to live a life of service. And now you come up with, or the, the team comes up with the, this idea of Ignite Pathways. Our audience has no idea what that is, so enlighten them a little bit. What is Ignite Pathways? And so Ignite Pathways, uh, the, the, the the Regional Center is, is a um, 7th through 12th grade um, opportunity. And there's three lanes in it. Seventh and eighth grade, we call it expository, ninth through twelfth grade. And then there's an adult learning piece. And and we want involved learning moving at the speed of business. So when we redid our mission, vision, values, goals for both the Woodbine Community School District and the Ignite Pathways Regional Center, we, we, we really focused in on that, that piece of it. We want it to be personalized, unparalleled, and we want it to be involved. And so we really try to, we start our meetings that way. It's really important to take that off the wall and onto the table. So, so um, we started um, about two and a half years ago with about 16 students in the middle of a semester, Matt. So you can, as you can imagine, we're like, okay. And, Why and wait, so right? Part of, right. Well, and you know, and so that goes back to go. I mean, just, just exactly. go. I mean, and, and so I, I, so we, we had 16 students um, that started and and then we went uh, moved into 32 and then we went to 125 and we're at 230 now. And two and a half of years. The things that, yeah, in two and a half years. Yeah. And, and and so now we're having to start to, to, to turn students away, which we really never. I mean, <laughs> I wish I could put into words what it feels like to say 
we had we had you know a community that's it's just a group of great people but has has you know like most rural communities has kind of declining enrollment over a series of years steadily slowly and steadily and then you get to a space where you're like wow i mean now we're we're having to turn students away or really give it a good scrub on like hey is this a fit really selective and and so it, it's just a it's it's a special feeling uh in terms of kind of saying look if if you innovate uh, and you change the system much as you've seen, it will work out. It does pay off. And we certainly still have challenges. Ignite Pathways, you know, now offers 100 courses at the regional center here, 45,000 square foot facility, state of the art, $15 million project. We passed a, passed a bond and then got a bunch of philanthropic money, which shows how much interest there is in, in, in really changing education for the better um, and, and really what we're doing here. Uh, you know, one of the early things we did early on, Matt, as we created uh, Ignite Pathways, we did two feasibility studies, and, and I would encourage everyone to consider thinking about that. We did a um, programming facil uh, feasibility study on what programs are available and what business needs were needed in our area, in the region, and then we did a financial feasibility study, and it showed that there's a lot of interest and in, in money um, interested in real change, not curtains and carpet change. Like, so we're really good at that sometimes too, right? But I mean, real change. I mean, deep change. And so um, Ignite now is is, is stood up. It, we went from, uh, you know, one one room in the crew center out over to our own brand new state-of-the-art facility with over $3 million in simulators um, and experiences for kids we just never would have had before. So um, yeah, it's-, it's yeah, uh, Absolutely amazing. You know, your words kind of are reminiscent for me. I have a good friend who's the CEO of a community college in the Midwest. And he, he gave me this line not too long ago that really stuck with me. He said, you know, in education, if you ask for money, you'll get advice. And if you ask for advice, <laughs> you'll get money. And I was like, that I is absolutely that. brilliant. It's just exactly right. So when we talk about a feasibility study, and I can tell from you talking, this isn't creating some blue ribbon commission that's going to study something for five years. Is what do we want to do? Let's make sure we're listening to our stakeholders. So let's get some really good ideas on and then let's go and run and, and take action. And really for the benefit of so many learners, you talk about pathways being, I think it was personalized, paralleled and involved, unparalleled and involved. Did I get that right? Personalized, unparalleled and, and involved. So about a middle, middle schooler, let's talk about a high schooler. What? Let's talk about an adult learner. What do those three words in that experience mean in terms of their experience from an education standpoint? So from a middle school perspective, well, in our feasibility study, just, you know, in, in our area, we found that we offer on an average 12 career and technical education courses in our in our area. Our kids were maybe getting access to four or five. You know, the urban centers were at 150. So it, it was an equity thing for us from our perspective and our definition of equity um, and underrepresentation. So our middle school students now, seventh and eighth grade students are being exposed to um, they, they have uh, they have many courses. So they have those four to six week courses across all six um, uh, career pathways and, and, and get some exposed to kind of the best and brightest of, of what that looks like. From our from our secondary perspective, nine through 12, again, the, the opportunities for kids is just is, has really um, just grown and, and blossomed. And so now they have over 100 classes that they can take in different forms or fashion. And we didn't want to be just transactional, Matt. We want to be transformational. One of the things that was transformational is, is truly incorporating the core credits through the student's voice and choice of their classroom. And so now we have um, in, in those class, in very specific courses, kids can get all four of their core credits, their science, their math, their language arts, and their social studies. And, and in part of the waiver that was approved by the Iowa Department of Education, which is a three-year study on, we believe kids will do better on standardized tests, even when we don't even focus on them, even when we do test prep, even when we don't do kind of carrot and stick kind of motivation, that they'll do even better when they have relevance. So if they can get a choice, we think just you pick the day in, in April or March or April, we'll send the kids in you. I bet you they'll stick and stay more information um, than before. And so that's a that's a study. It's, it's part of the dissertation I'm working on now. Um, and it's part of the DE study that they did a site visit on last year and, and we'll hopefully follow up this year. So then that third piece is adult learning. So let me give you an example of that. We, we just need to be faster and funnier and in, in, in meeting the needs of business. And so um, we have a local uh, manufacturer named Tommy Gate uh, and Tommy Gate Manufacturing. They do the lift gates, you know. Oh, well, so you bet. We're so yep. blessed to have them in town. They could be anywhere, really, quite frankly. And we just are very lucky to have them and just a great family that runs it. And and they were saying during COVID, look, we have a, you know, we just need workers like like most of the country and, and specifically we need welders. And so 
we sat down and said, what do you need? And they'd tell us what kind of thing, MIG welders and, you know, um, and this is what we need. And so we said, okay, let's sit down. We, we, we kind of shopped around with colleges, universities, great, you know, just good people in those university levels and colleges level. We came back and we said, it's going to be about at that time, about 18 months to have those welders rocking and rolling on the assembly line. And then it's going to be about $7,200 at that time to get that done. And they, and they looked at me and in the military, we said they paused for effect. And they looked at me and said, <laughs> yeah, you're not listening. <laughs> and they were right. right. We need them today. We yeah. don't need them 18 months from now. We don't even know what right. it will look like 18 months from now. So we did the napkin. We called our napkin conversation. We wrote it down and said, go. And so, you know, four months later, they had MIG welders. They had, for us, it was six MIG welders is what they needed. Um, and their stick and stability has been good overall. And it's changed those six students' lives. There's just some great stories I'd love to get into about the individual students who, um, well, give us the, one. We got we got a little bit of time. Tell us one great story. So, so I, I, I so th there's a student who, um, you know, their their whole life, and they um, had really been marginalized. To be very honest, quiet kid, just a great great student. And um, this particular student was, you know, somebody who didn't see a lot of value in in sitting in the desks and rows, and even got to the point where they were on they were special education, had an IP, and those kinds of things. And and so we connected them. Uh, with with uh, the need at Tommy Gate, got them the training they need, and you know th this was as you know as late as even six months ago. They they were work he he was working the night shift in the in the mid shift, and they said they absolutely couldn't run their shift without him. So I go in and talk to him because I want to see it. And so you know I, I call him, I go in and talk to him, and I said, "How's it going?" And and he is he would never talk if he you know if, if he had to, and and uh, he mm -hmm. looked at me and he just said, "It's changed my life." That's it. Awesome. That's what we're shooting yeah. for, right? I know it's simple, but it's, you know, it's changed my life. I, I give you one other example. We were invited to the governor of Iowa's condition of, uh, condition of the state and the governor's done a great job. And I would love to talk about some of the policy things she's put into place that have made these things possible. I mean, that, that's just a really important sidebar to all this. Governor Reynolds has been amazing, a leader uh, on the on the CTE education side, and we appreciate her. So I'm sitting in the upper balcony. I don't know if you've ever been in there, but it's a really small. They're not made for big guys. These old older seats, they're really nice. And so I'm kind of squeezing into them, and I'm sitting next to a student. And, and uh, in the middle of her speech, she mentions Ignite. It's a couple of years ago when we were getting kind of rocking and rolling. And he, he started, you know, he's heard sniffling and crying next to me. And I kind of turned over and, hey, is everything all right? So do you know how much this has changed my life? And he went into his story, which I won't get into here. But these are these are people. And and I, and I, another sidebar to this, Matt, we're seeing is a lot of boys from our perspective, and that's a really granular data piece that we're seeing. We're not meeting their needs, and we just got to do better. So in those both those instances, um, you know, we saw you know boys, but it, it just they were life changers. Um, and and that's maybe another episode some other time i'd love to get into their whole stories because they're they're not just the curtains in the carpet so absolutely you know we we'd love to do that as well those are the stories we love you know that's what we're all about at the end of the day is securing the american dream for the next generation of stem and workforce talent and those are two perfect examples of students that would have never had those opportunities or likely never had them if not for your leadership and vision and and the tenacity of uh, just not just on your part justin but i'm sure on the part of many to uh, to see this to fruition and to, to create the disruption that you have as you went through those last couple of answers i'm reminiscent of a couple things the first of all first one is that i mentioned in the intro that our connection was governor doug Bergen with the state of North Dakota. I met the governor on a statewide tour of his of, his, of the entire state of North Dakota earlier this year, um, <laughs> driving a big sprint, sprinter van yeah, that had yeah. a gigantic Tommy Gate on the back of it. So, uh, so I've got that. Not only am I familiar with that great employer and 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 that story about that first student, but but I, I'm a customer of that company uh, and, and a big fan. So we've got that going for us. So much of what you just talked about, we did an episode about six months ago or so. Corey Steiner, who's the uh, superintendent of a, of a small school district north of Fargo, North Dakota, called Northern Cass. And when he found, and you guys have to talk if you don't know Corey, um, what he found through some of the same disruption, and some of it was a little bit, their, their approach was, was different, um, but, but unique in its own way. But something that you said, Justin, absolutely resonated with me because because Corey said to me, look, what we found was these students on these with these alternative learning experiences. And, and as, as an example, they, they had one student who wanted to be a blacksmith. And they said, if you want to be a blacksmith and you can show us how your blacksmith work ties to the state standard, we'll let you come. Back. And so that's just one example. Um, but they had these students that, you know, several years later now are scoring better on the standardized tests than the students going through the traditional pathway. And that doesn't mean that the traditional path isn't right for some students, but boy, for some other ones, uh, it's just 
incredible. And there's a lot of synergy, I think, between some of the disruption that you're going through and what, what Corey's doing. One key difference is the, the number of different types of learners that you have under the same roof. So middle schoolers, high schoolers, uh, uh, adult learners, all learning in the same building. Are, are there certain benefits and advantages that come from that? Yeah, well, I think it, it captures the spirit that can happen at any age level. And so we always found too, you know, when I was when I was in middle school, it was probably no different. You always looked up to the seniors. You know, the juniors and seniors could do no wrong. And so if you see them trying new things and 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 making it work as they go through it, you know, I think that's an important culture to set. You know, for those middle school kids to say, hey, I'm gonna go try that. You know, um, so so I think that's that's an important piece for them to see that. And and here's the other thing: we're trying to blur lines across the learning continuum. The only time that, you know, five-year-olds are with five-year-olds um, and they learn at the same time and the same pace at the same rate is in school. I mean, I, I know you both are way younger than I am, but look look at the look at the experiences that thank you for that, you, but you know, I doubt it. Go on. <laughs> you know, we we just I, I think we 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 just know that let's focus on learning and not age. And so that's what we try to do at that middle school level. We had another story where we had a student that finished this was on the Woodbine campus in the morning and the afternoon went to the Ignite campus. And this was a middle school student and and he finished um he finished social studies. So that's the new system we said he finished social studies up in a semester when you know, it normally takes a year. So his parents called and said, Hey, you know, we'd really like to see, is it, he really likes science. Can he double down on science second semester? Like, absolutely. We would have never been able to have that system conversation to personalize it for that student ever before. And the, the other powerful thing there, parent involvement. We call it our three-prong approach. You got to have... You got to have data to show that they understand what they're doing. You got to have the teacher in the classroom to go, yep, they're ready. And the final piece is the parent. You know what? I think they are ready. They can move on. Or you know what? They're not ready. I want you to go deeper into the standards. The parents get that final choice. And what we've found is that the parents know their kids pretty well. <laughs> and so, yeah, for and sure, it, right? And so that piece of it in terms of like whether it's seventh grade or eighth grade or at the, at the secondary level or even the adult learning lane, um, you know, we're, we're finding that empowerment of parents on that side of it. And we and we can still keep growing on that side of it is, is really good. It's very good indeed. And and just uh, you think about that three legged stool, the parent and the and the district all together for the same end, which is a great outcome for that that student. And in the end, a great outcome for the community as well. So disruption leading to great outcomes. Um, disruption doesn't necessarily take take place all the time without the ability to bend the rules a little bit. You touched on a little bit earlier your dissertation and this, uh, you know, this dispensation, I guess, that you got from the state of Iowa. Just give us a little more flavor for uh, how you needed to get a little bit of a, a waiver from the state and what that means. Yeah, so the state, um, so we wrote a, what it calls seat time waiver. So in, chap in Iowa, we have what's called Chapter 12 that covers you know, really the K-12, um, you know, the framework for what you ha what you can and cannot do within schools. So within Iowa at the 9th through 12th grade level, you have to have 200 minutes a week in order to be considered, you know, for credit. So our seat time waiver was to say, we want to we want to get rid of the waiver. We want kids to move. We want to create a system that moves at the speed of students learning. And so and that so that's what we did. And, and they gave us a three year waiver, which we appreciate very much. One of the things that's really important is everybody wants innovation. We want that at the state level, the national level, the local level. But right now, our policies, where I'm finding, even at the state and at the national level, and maybe as you've seen, Matt, they're just incongruent with innovation and disruption. So we're constantly encouraging them to just let us do some trial and error. You know, I think some people might say, you know, boy, it's, it's just... I want you to try innovation at your school because I don't want my son or daughter innovated on. I don't want this to be this experiment. And I always try to remind people, public education is the grandest experiment in the history of experiments, and it changes weekend to weekend. You know, you could have a kid that went home with a, two loving parents and have had just a, an incredible experience being a kid, and they come off on a weekend and they're ready for Monday off a of Christmas break. And, and then you could get a kid who just didn't have any of that interaction and then and, and having the outcome. It's just, it's just this constant churn in the gonky litter of decision making on what you do today. And in the past, we just cookie cuttered it, and, and this time we don't. I, and I think the policy that this waiver allowed us, that was the backbone of it. And, I, and I'll, I'll repeat this again. I really appreciate Governor Reynolds' leadership on allowing open enrollment. That gave parents choice, uh, kind of um, uh, loosening those open enrollment rules and, and allows for parents' choice. And, and then education savings accounts uh, were passed in Iowa. It's, as you can imagine, very controversial. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think what we need to do is say, okay, here's the new rules. Okay, let's get with parents. Parents have choice now. 
they didn't really have it before, to be honest. You know, they could have moved if they wanted to, but I think this policy and the work with the DE has been super helpful in trying to kind of allow us to give us that autonomy to, to, to try something different. Absolutely. You know, some of your comments just um, take me back a few years to the very early days of this podcast, Justin. And one of our first guests, the first six months or so was Dr. Joel Gothard, who is the uh, superintendent of the St. Paul Public School District and um, in Minnesota, not too far northeast of you, a little ways, but, uh, you know, in terms of the, the size of the United States, maybe not so far. Um, and, and, and Dr. Gothard said, look, and this just, it absolutely stuck with me. He said, if you look at the average American classroom, he said, it doesn't look much different than it did in the 1950s. You know, we had the baby boom. We had everybody come back from the war. We had to educate all these students. We created this model of education moving from, in some cases, a one-room schoolhouse, which was how my parents were educated, by the way, through eighth grade to, you know, to, to the, the model that we have now. And he's like, in so many ways, we haven't changed that in, in 70 years. And and then you think about needing to innovate and innovation in education. It's, you know, it's not a it's not a um, a left leaning issue or a right leaning issue. I think in a lot of cases, this is we all see the need to do things differently and to disrupt. It's just finding opportunities to um, to live that disruption and maybe make a couple exceptions and try a few things. And if they work, fantastic. And if they don't, let's go back to the drawing board. But it's still. So let's let's talk about student success. So we talked about metrics a little bit that don't work. We talked about that qualitatively. We talked about that a little bit quantitatively. How do you know? And I, I'm sure one of them is just the huge growth in in uh, participation in this program uh, is a good indication that you're onto something phenomenal. But two and a half years in, I'm sure there's still a lot of outcomes you still want to measure. How do you know you're being successful? And and what are you going to measure going forward? So student enrollment, academics behaviors. And so that student enrollment increase largest in the in in the history of, of Woodbine Community School is is a great um, great indicator. I think that's the ultimate the ultimate product of, of lots of decisions. Um, the second piece is behaviors. Behaviors are down 167 percent. Our audience that may not be familiar with the term, what's a behavior? So when we talk about behaviors, there's a very there's major and minor categories as they have to be defined by the by the Department of Education and Conditions for Learning Assessment. And we certainly take our own kind of metrics as well, but then those are uploaded into the system. So major and minor, and then they have definitions of what the what the major and minor are. And so that's what's that. an example. So uh, a minor example would be a detention. A major example would be a suspension. And so, okay, so um, this is getting well, in trouble in school. It's 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 yeah. it's right. I mean, yeah. is it right in the layman's it's, term? Right? Yeah, there is. If you're doing something you're not supposed to do and you're getting in trouble for that and your your name is being announced on the PA as you got to go down to the assistant principal's office, at least that's what happened in my high school quite some time ago. Um, that's what we're talking about is the is, is is kids not doing what they need. So now you, what they should be doing down 167 percent. I mean, that's that's incredible. What that tells me is that you've got students that are, you know, that are engaged, that are interested, that are excited, that see the reason and the purpose for why they're there, that they want to at least, you know, to the extent they can color inside the line so that they can remain there. Is that is that what you're seeing? And then go on to that third one. Yeah, that's absolutely what we're seeing. And what we're seeing is when their needs are met and it's just in time, just in case needs, and it's at every level, you know, um, then we we we, uh, we know that they're paying attention and that, that the uh, information is more relevant and they're willing to stay on task more, quite frankly. You know, I, I just look at the adult test of that. You know, if I'm sitting in a conference or I'm sitting in a meeting and, and, and you know, the information I, I've, I'll give is as little as 10 or 15 minutes. If I feel like it's not, I mean, you stick, you stay, but you start tuning out a little bit. And we expect kids to do that all the time. We know the research on state changes. We want every seven to eight minutes, we want a different and new interaction for our kids. And we think that's helping our behaviors. Um, and so so that's important. And then ultimately, academic achievement, right? We, we want our kids to understand and know um, the essential standards that we've identified, which is on our 13 steps, uh, the essential standard identification, which has to have you know vertical and horizontal alignment. We want them to know it and we want them to retain it and we want them to be able to apply it. And so at the end of the day, we want enrollment, behaviors and academics to be really kind of our focus and our outcome. Now, I will give one caveat there, Matt, as we talk about our goals for Ignite Pathways, we have an adult learning goal that we absolutely want to, uh, you know, reduce training cycles, uh, which we've done again here in a recent example with an OSHA 10 certification. We're able to work with the business and get them uh, in and out within a matter of days, right back on the line where it would have taken, you know, sometimes months or even longer to do that. So that's the only caveat I'll say in terms of deliverables and, and our goals and, and um, kind of knowing whether we're meeting where we need to go. Sure, absolutely. And like any good measurement and, and any good expectation, it's okay it's okay to morph those over time too, as expectations are changing and, and you and you're continuing to have success. So certainly keeping your 
you know, keeping your eyes open and making sure you're hitting those outcomes. Are there other outcomes? I mean, you shared a couple great stories of of adult learners and students that uh, ended up in, in really cool career opportunities that were were a huge blessing to them. Uh, you talked about, you know, the, the increase in enrollment, the fact that you've got, you know, students that uh, their behaviors are, are improving uh, significantly, um, and, the, and certainly the academic performance. Any other outcomes that you want to point to? Uh, two and a half years in, so still, uh, still lots to measure. But, but anything that comes to mind? Yeah, we want our good staff to stay. So that you know, what happens in real communities is you get you know really good ones. You train them up. You go through the process, and they're like, I'm going to go somewhere else for you know ten grand more, fifteen grand more, and you can't blame them. You know, we did a survey. Um, it was our first bite at the apple of being identified as one of the best places to work in Iowa. So it's a process schools don't usually do. It's usually a business. So this first survey was surveys that staff responded to lots of questions about lots of things. And it went directly to the the, the survey kind of company. So I didn't, I didn't see the results. And I thought this would be a good three, four year kind of, you know, goal. We came back the first year and were identified as one of the best places to work in Iowa and one of the best schools. And so but but what that does, that's a deliverable for, for me. There's so many great people now that this capacity has been built. I am the least most important person in terms of saying, look, we got to do this every day. And so that, as you said, deliverable, if we lose good staff members, it, it's it's um, it's it's devastating, quite frankly, because now we've gotten to be able to get to this group that has a collective why. School didn't work for them. And now they're passionate beyond a paycheck to say, I want to change it. And, and I can't, I can never hire enough people, you know, to try to capture that. As you've seen in your career too, I mean, just, so that's a deliverable. That was a very specific goal of ours to be one of the best places to work in Iowa. We hit it right out of the chute. But the challenge now is, you know, that, how do mm-hmm. we continue to grow that? How do we For continue sure. to find our shadows in this process? Well, and I think, you know, I don't want to hear that word good. I don't want that to be lost on our audience. You say retain our good people. Um, you know, we used to, and that's the important part, right? I mean, if there's somebody that isn't necessarily aligned with the goals or the the culture of the organization or the mission, and that's fine. Not everybody is, you know, you're less concerned about those. You're really worried about the, the great team members. Or as we used to say uh, in manufacturing, we always wanted to send our worst customers and our worst employees to our competitors and we keep the good ones, but that's a different way, <laughs> different way of looking at it. Um, uh, but, but I, you know, hanging on to good staff members and then, and the designation is a great place to work. I mean, that becomes a great recruiting tool too, right? So as you continue to scale and you can go to new instructional talent or new new administrative leaders, new staff members, whatever you want to call them, um, and say, look, we're we're an awesome place to work and we don't believe us, believe the people that already work here. Um, that that really helps you to continue to, to scale what you're doing there um, with Ignite. So I think all that speaks to, you know, you know, you're hitting on everything well when you've got excited parents, when you've got staff and, and instructional talent and administrative talent that's excited to be there. You have students that are excited to be there. I know we've got districts that are listening to this episode, Justin, saying, wow, I wish we could do that. Um, or we'd love to learn more. We, and we'll get into how, how folks can learn more in just a minute. But if I'm a if I'm a district administrator, I'm another superintendent. I'm somebody who's keen on disrupting education in my own district. Um, you know, what advice would you have uh, that they should be thinking about and doing that you haven't already shared with us? Well, I'd go right back to what I started with in the beginning and say go. And so that the, the you know, from the strategic level, it's go. From the operational and tactical levels, I would tell them immediately to have an experience with the leadership in your community that will change your behavior. So go see that district that you've strived to be. And, and you know, we went to 11 school districts that we visited that were really, we thought were cutting edge, and they are, incredible things they were doing. And we took one or two things away from every single visit. And we put it together to bake this casserole that works for us. And so I think that's what I would encourage people to do. If you see a place, we've got a group of 30 folks flying in from Michigan here in the next couple of weeks. We have a constant revolving door of folks coming through and they want to see it. Um, And I think what they do, we just want them to take away one thing that's going to work for them. This whole thing may not work for you, but just take one thing away, add it to what you already know works in your community and your region, and then go. And so that's probably a tangible takeaway. For sure. Yeah. I mean, don't wait around. Don't sit around. Try something. Get going. Let's let's not waste time. Let's start something mid-semester. Let's blow up the traditional model. Don't blow up the traditional rules as, in, in, at least as little as we as we have to and, and get on with things and get on with changing lives and making the world a better place, which is kind of where we started our discussion together today. Justin, I want to give you an opportunity if people want to learn more. Uh, you talk about a school district from Michigan making their trip over there to Western Iowa. Uh, how can people learn more about what's going on at Ignite? So they can check out our website, um, www.ignitepathways.com. 
Um, and then the Woodbine Community School District, because like you said, it's simultaneously done in both lanes. So the K-12 system was been, has been entirely reworked on the Woodbine side. And then the Ignite Pathway system is our career and technical education approach to um, making sure information sticks and stays. So Woodbine Community Schools uh, in Iowa is the, is the website. And then Ignite Pathways Regional Center um, is the uh, Ignite Pathways 712 uh, career and technical ed experience. And if our audience didn't get that down, they can go right to the show notes as always, and that'll be right there for them to uh, to link up to. So we'll look forward to making that as easy as possible for the audience. I want to ask one final question, Justin, just a great conversation we've had today about disruption. Uh, you know, I want to go back to, you grew up in in in, uh, in Iowa, right? Did I understand that just outside yes. of Sioux City? Did I follow that right? Yep, right outside of Sioux City on the Nebraska side, but it's Sioux land. So it's right in that kind of where all the river, where the river meets and all three I know, right, I know exactly, I know exactly <laughs> where you're talking about. And um, so you're growing up in, in that region of the Midwest and it's, I mean, that's God's country right there. I can tell you for sure. And I've spent time there. Um, it is a long drive if you're, if you're heading West, as I did not too long ago across all the, all the way across the state of Iowa, all all the way across the state of Nebraska. But what you'll find as you're making that trip is incredible people and really the kind of people that are the fabric of the United States of America. So you're you're growing up there, Justin. You're a 15-year-old kid. You've got your whole life ahead of you. Maybe you're a sophomore in high school, you know, and you've done all these great things, you know, service in the military, amazing leadership in, in education. Um, but if you could go back in time and give that young Justin Wagner one piece of advice, what would it be? Ooh, wow. Um don't go out with Becky to the dance and the, um, when she asked you in homecoming. It doesn't work out. You know, she was way out of your league. She's way out of your league, dude. Don't even ask that's her. Awesome. I mean, I yeah, got Yeah, that's the first one. We've never had anybody say, no, don't go out with Becky. But uh, yeah, she's she's an amazing woman. And I, you know, I was way out of my league. And so I got shut down. But anyway, if she's listening, hey, she's, she's a rock star. I, you know, I grew up um, not much. We have, you know, seven people in our family, kind of a, you know, one bedroom ish ish house. And, and, uh, you know, and so I, I, I look at that, you know, at the time and there were some, some real challenges, loved my family very much and appreciated them. And so I, I guess I, I think what I would go back to my 15 year old self is, um, is probably say, you know, I think at the end of the day, disruption and change are hard. They're just hard. And there's points where you're going to want to take a knee and, um, you got to just keep going keep going step by step, inch by inch, life's a cinch, yard by yard, life's pretty hard. So just keep going. And I, you know, it's kind of really advice from a, a ranger, a special operator that I know. And he was trying to, he, you know, he talked about his story and he just said every morning, I just didn't have nothing left. He said, just every morning, put one foot in front of the other. He said, by the time, pretty soon you look back and you're like, wow, that was pretty cool. And so, and I think the other piece of advice that I learned that I that I want my 15 year old self to, to know too, Matt, is you know, this does not happen alone. Early and often build capacity, like get others that are like-minded on board with you and then learn from them. That was a great answer. You think about growing up in a, you know, in a rural area, um, a one bedroom home, uh, seven, you know, seven family members and going step by step and, and inch by inch all the way to being one of the leading disruptors in K-12 in the United States and, and literally now having a national platform and, and uh, national interest in the great thing that you're doing. And to your point, building capacity along the way, it's never just one individual. It's never one leader. It always takes an entire team. And I know you've got a great team there. Justin, that, that you're working with. Can't thank you enough for, for coming on. This is a wonderful conversation about disruption, about a unique aspect of disruption. You had some great personal examples of students whose lives you've changed, even in the two and a half years that you've been doing this. I know as we look two and a half years ahead and, and even further, you'll have even more and more of those stories. We look forward to having you back sometime and continuing to share, to share the success. Uh, we've got Justin Wagner, the superintendent of Woodbine School District with us. Great conversation. Thanks so much for being on. Thank you very much. Thanks for your leadership, Matt, and for having the podcast. I think it's great. I appreciate that very much. Well, if Justin Wagner isn't a tech ed disruptor, I don't know who is. I had just a great opportunity and a great time spending time with Justin, learning a little bit more about all the great things that he is doing in the Woodbine School District there in the western end of Iowa. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode. As you know, we referenced the show notes several times throughout this episode. And to get all of those notes and links to resources mentioned in this episode, you need to go to techedpodcast.com slash Wagner. That's W-A-G-N-E-R, techedpodcast.com slash Wagner. We have the absolute best show notes anywhere in the world of podcast, and you will find helpful information 
there. Now, don't forget, we are active on all kinds of social media platforms. You'll find us on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram, and TikTok. We post all the time about new episodes, insights that we're featuring, great content. Find us on your favorite social media platform and say hello. We would love to connect.